We now get to the actual hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, and the hadith is in Bukhari, I don't remember any day except that my parents were Muslims. And I don't remember any day except that the Prophet Sallallahu would come visiting us in our house. Sometimes in the morning and in the evening. And then Aisha narrates that when the Prophet Sallallahu was given the permission to migrate and he told the Muslims to migrate, Abu Bakr prepared a camel to migrate to Medina. And he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for permission. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, wait, for I hope that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will give us permission. And so when Abu Bakr heard this, he asked, are you hoping for my companionship? Meaning, can I be with you? And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, yes, this is what I'm hoping for. So when Abu Bakr heard this, he prepared two camels instead of one. And he said, I did this for four months. We know that he emigrated on a Monday because Ibn Abbas as a Sahih Muslim that the Prophet Sallallahu reported that on Monday, Iqra was revealed to me. I became a prophet. And on Monday, I was born. And on Monday, I emigrated. According to our best estimates, the 26th of Safa, in the 13th year of the Da'wah, this would basically be the first year of the Hijrah. On that day, in the daytime, Aisha is narrating the same hadith, that when we were sitting in our house at the peak of the heat of the day, at noontime, it's a hot day, we saw a figure approaching and the streets were deserted, nobody's there. And the figure had wrapped his turban around his head. Muqanna'an is, it's like the man who wraps the turban around his face, you cannot see him. Until we recognize from the distance that it is the Prophet Wasallam. And so we said, Wallahi, the only reason he must be coming is for something very grave to have occurred. This is an emergency. Nobody comes at this time. So the Prophet Wasallam asked permission to come in. Abu Bakr granted it to him. And he said, remove everybody from the room. And Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, they are but your family. That's it. I.e. Aisha and her sister. That's all there was there. And of course, Aisha had already been engaged to the Prophet Wasallam. The nikah had been done. And so the Prophet Wasallam said, Allah has given me permission to emigrate. Now Abu Bakr was waiting for permission to come to him as well. And so he asked him, O Messenger of Allah, did Allah allow me to be the companion? I beg you by my mother and father, did Allah give this permission? And the Prophet Wasallam said, Now Aisha says that I saw Abu Bakr cry and I had never believed that people could cry out of happiness until I saw Abu Bakr cry out of happiness on that day. Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, I have prepared two camels. One of them is yours. And the Prophet ﷺ said, only if I pay you the price of the camel till it becomes mine. And Asma, who is Aisha's older sister, Aisha is too young to do anything. So Asma had already prepared food and reserves for them. And so in the panic of the moment, she bundled up all of the food and she didn't have anything to tie the bag with. And so she took off her belt and tore it in half with her teeth and used half of a belt for her own garment and then used the other half for the bag of the Prophet and Abu Bakr and that is why she was called she of the two belts. And Abu Bakr had at this point in time 5,000 dirhams. So he took every last dirham that he had and he left nothing with Asma and Aisha. Why? Because he wants every penny for the Prophet And Ibn Abbas says Allah revealed in the Quran one ayah describing that night, the night of the Hijrah. And that is Surah Al-Anfal, verse 30. وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُوا بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَخْرُجُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ when the people who disbelieved plotted secretly to either try to imprison you or to exile you or to kill you. And Allah Azza wa Jal plotted and they plotted. And Allah is the blessed best of those who plan. What happened that night? They came together in Darun Nadwa. Darun Nadwa was their parliament. And they came together in the middle of the night. There was a secret meeting. And representatives from all of the tribes of the Quraysh came except for the Banu Hashim. And so Abu Abu Lahab was not invited for this meeting. It's a matter of the customs of the time. How could Abu Lahab allow his own nephew to get killed knowingly? This would have been a shame for Abu Lahab as long as he lived. So he also was not invited. And they also left out another very important figure. And that is Mutam ibn Adi. Mutam ibn Adi is the one who's basically allowed the Prophet ﷺ to remain in Mecca. It's his protection, not Abu Lahab's. And it is also said in a narration that has a slight missing link in it, that an old man came knocking on the door in the middle of the night. And when they opened the door, they saw a man they could not recognize who he was. They said, who are you? He said, I am 
am a leader from the Najd and it has reached me that you're having a meeting and allow me to come. Perhaps I can benefit you with my wisdom about what you're planning to do. And Ibn Abbas says this was Shaytan. This was Shaytan who wanted to seal the plot, make sure that the actual plot that was done was that of assassination. When they came together, they began talking to one another and they said, the Muslims have now migrated to another land. And we are scared if we allow this man to leave, they will become a political threat to Mecca. The first suggestion, let's imprison him in a house. And this is what Allah is saying, bituka. They want to tie you up. And the old man, basically Iblis said, if you were to do this, his words would still reach his followers. Another said, let us send him into exile. يُخْرِجُوكَ Allah says in the Quran. Again, Iblis said, sending him into exile is to send him back to his followers. It will strengthen them rather than weaken them. And here is where Abu Jahl, of course, was in the audience. And Abu Jahl said, you still haven't said the point that is on everybody's mind, but they're scared to say it. Well, let me say it, Abu Jahl. Why don't we kill him? But we'll do this in a way that nobody can get angry at any one tribe. Abu Jahl said, rather than one of us attack him, why not every single tribe sends one representative? And they fight him like one man, such that by the time he's dead, his blood is on all of their swords. So nobody knows who killed him, and all of the tribes are equally to blame. And he said, the Banu Hashim will have no choice but to accept the blood money. Otherwise, the Banu Hashim would have had to declare war. This was when Iblis stood up and said, this is the Ra'i Sadid, this is the smart decision. And right then and there, every one of the tribe people thought of one person in their tribe, the, a young, strong man, whom they could choose for this deed. And they sent them immediately to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was when Jibreel came down to the Prophet Sallallahu and informed him that you must make the Hijrah now. So so this was on the same evening that he spoke into Abu Bakr and Ibn Ishaq reports without any isnad that as they surrounded the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu went outside reciting Surah Yasin and they did not recognize him or they did not see him at all. We put barriers in front of them and behind them so we caused them to go blind or we covered them up and they couldn't see anything. He threw dust on their hair as a sign of humiliation as he walked out and and they didn't even see this until after he had left. At the time, he was still living in the house of Khadija, of course, because Khadija has passed away. So he's living in the house. And with him is, of course, Ali, because he's supposed to be taking care of Ali. Ali grew up in the household of the Prophet wasallam. And so he told Ali to stay in his bed so that if the Quraysh looked in, they would find somebody lying there. And it's dark. Nobody sees who it is. They would assume that this is the Prophet wasallam. Now, Abu Bakr anh, had already prepared the two camels. The Prophet wasallam, came to the the house of Abu Bakr in the middle of the night, the two of them in the middle of the night rode their camels and they went to, as we all know, the cave of Ghari Thawr. Medina is due north, straight line. Ghari Thawr is due south, exact opposite. And so they had already devised a plot to go to this cave and stay there for three days and three nights in utmost secrecy. They would then meet with a guide who would take them from a path that was unknown to the Quraysh. And in fact, they had to circle down to what is now Jeddah. And then they made their way to Medina from Jeddah. It is said that when the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca, a Tirmidhi reports in his Sunan, when he passed the final shops of Mecca, the middle of the night, he turned around to take one final look. And he said, speaking to Mecca generically or metaphorically, you are the most blessed land on earth and the most beloved to me. And were it not for the fact that my people have expelled me, I would never have left you. Ibn Kathir has over here that he also made a long dua and he has the dua recorded where he basically asks Allah for protection. He asks Allah to make the safa easy for him. He asks Allah for his mercy and his protection. Getting back to the story of Abu Bakr and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had made an arrangement with three people to do three chores. The first was his son Abdullah, that every morning he would come out with some food and drink for the cave because they're not going to leave the cave at all. And he would listen to the people of Mecca what they're doing, which direction they're heading. In. So he would inform them on a daily basis in case they need to modify their plan. The second person, Aisha says, Amir ibn Fuhayr. He was Abu Bakr's freed servant. His job was to take out the flocks and make sure that the footsteps
steps of Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr are erased away. And then there was a third man assigned for the job, and that is Abdullah ibn Arqat or Urayqit. And his job was to lead them down this, what we now call Tariq al Hijrah. And Abdullah ibn Urayqit would meet them on the morning of the third night, and he would take them on this new road. In a narration that is Muttafaq Ali, that's Bukhari and Muslim, Anas ibn Malik says that Abu Bakr narrated to us the details of the journey. Jabal Thawr was a very small chamber, and it is said that there was only space literally for two people in that Jabal. Now, Abu Bakr saw the Quraysh walking up and down the cave. Question arises, how did they get there? And this is not mentioned in this narration. It is mentioned in other books, Al-Baladuri and other books mentioned, that when the Quraysh figured out that the Prophet had not gone the usual road, because all the other Muhajirun had taken the usual road, they hired an expert scout to figure out the traces of the camel from the house of Abu Bakr. And so he leads them to the base of Gharitha. And he goes, this is where I can trace it. From here, it's a mountain I can't follow anymore. So what happens? They all send in the troops and the forces, right? And so this is the famous incident that Abu Bakr looks out and he sees Abu Jahad and then Umayyah ibn Khalaf and all of them. That's why they were on the mountain. And this is when he whispers to the Prophet ﷺ that all they need to do is to look into this crevice and they will see us. If they just look down at their feet where they, we are now, they would see us because the entrance to the cave, it's at feet level. And this is when the Prophet ﷺ responded to the famous phrase that all of you should know and memorize. Oh Abu Bakr, what do you think of two people? Allah is the third of them. So they crossed over the Ghar Thawr and they didn't realize they were in there. And there's a beautiful verse in Surah at tawbah which is one of the last surahs revealed at a time when the Muslims were at the peak of their power. After the conquest of Mecca, Allah Azza wa Jal says to the Sahaba, if you're not going to help the Prophet Sallallahu don't worry, Allah has already helped him. When the Kufar expelled him from Mecca. Thani athnaini. And he was the second of only two people. Idhuma fil ghari. When they were in the cave. Idh yaqulu li sahibihi la tahzan. When he said to his companion, la tahzan. Inna Allah ma'ana. Don't worry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. Fa'anzal Allahu sakinatahu alayhi. At that point, Allah sent his sakina upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa yaduhu bi junoodin lam taroha. And he helped him with an army that you didn't see. A lot of scholars say this army is basically the dove and the pigeon and the spider. They are mentioned in some of the books. The story of the spider web is mentioned in Musnad Imam Ahmad, and there is a slight weakness in it. And so, out of all of the stories, this is the best story. As for the narration of the tree leaning down over the mouth, or the two pigeons setting up a nest, these are reported with massive missing links. So, third, fourth generation reporting what happened in the time of the Prophet. So, no problem narrating it, but we should know that this is not like 100% authentic. And so, after the third day, they met Abdullah ibn Arqat or Abdullah ibn Urayqil, and three of them began going on their way to Medina and the booty, the bounty, the war money of a hundred camels had been placed on Abu Bakr and the Prophet dead or alive. And Suraqa ibn Malik says that he was sitting with his fellow tribesmen and the news comes that they're searching for three riders. And one of my people came back from a hunting expedition and he says, I saw three people in the distance. I'm sure this must be the three the Quraysh are looking for. Suraqa got greedy. So immediately he lied and he says, oh no, no, that's not those three. That's the party of so-and-so. They told me they're going on an expedition in that region. The man who thought it was, it came up excited. He sat down, conversation continued. Suraka says when they forgot about the incident, he slipped away, rushed back home, got his war horse ready, put on his armor, and galloped at lightning speed as fast as he could to get to those three people. And Suraka says, when I saw them in the distance, I saw that one of the two, i.e. Abu Bakr, was riding in a very agitated state, always looking right and left, sometimes behind, sometimes going to the front, sometimes going back behind, sometimes going to the front. Because he's so worried about the Prophet ﷺ, that he's worried he's going to be attacked from the back, he goes in the back. Then his paranoia gets the better of him. What if he's attacked from the front? He goes to the front. Whereas the other rider was riding calmly and peacefully, not turning once left or right, reciting something, reciting the Quran, reciting something. All of a sudden, my horse sunk into the ground and threw me, flipped me over. And it had never done this before. In another version, he said that I could see a smoke between me and the three riders. Something's clearly wrong. And so he said, I pulled out my Aslam. Aslam is their method of predicting the future. So he has those things with him. So he said, I threw out my Aslam onto the sand to see which direction is going to go. And the response that I got was, do not proceed. I ignored it and continued going. 
The second time I came closer, once again, the exact same thing happened. Once again, I was thrown across the horse. Once again, I took it out. Once again, it says, do not proceed. I ignored it and went for the third time until finally they were within yelling distance. I could speak to them. And for the third time, my horse did it even more violently. And I knew that this was a force beyond me, beyond my power. And I knew that the affair of this man would spread, i.e. Islam would spread. So I called out to them that I am a safe person. I'm not going to harm you. Give me permission to come close. From the one who's hunting, he becomes the one asking permission. So when he finally got permission to come forth, Suraqa ibn Malik says that I asked permission from the Prophet وسلم, to give me protection in writing. And the Prophet allowed Abdullah ibn Arqat to write down on a scroll, write down on a parchment, a man for Suraqa ibn Malik, that you will be safe. You protected us today, we're going to protect you tomorrow whenever the need comes. Suraqa said, I offered them some food and the both of them refused. They had no need of it. But Abu Bakr said, don't tell anybody about us. And so Suraqa didn't tell anybody about them until finally, when they did arrive in Medina, by the way, Suraqa told them all the story that happened and Abu Jahl wrote him a scathing poem where he called Suraqa the foolish that they slipped out of your hands. And Suraqa wrote back poetry, this all in Ibn Ishaq. And he said to him that, had you been there on that day, and you had seen what I had seen, then you wouldn't be saying what you're saying. Ibn Abdul Bar, another very early author says that when Suraqa turned to leave, the Prophet ﷺ for the first time turned to him and said to him, Oh Suraqa, how will you be the day that you put on the bracelets of Kisra. Suraqa, shocked, couldn't say anything other than Kisra, the son of Hurmuz, meaning the emperor of Persia. And that's it, the Prophet didn't even respond. And on the day of Hunayn, the Prophet ﷺ conquered basically the other tribes outlying Mecca, and he finally conquered the tribe of Suraqa ibn Malik. He pulled out the very piece of leather that he had, that the Prophet ﷺ had written to him, and the Prophet ﷺ recognized Suraqa, and he gave him the security, he gave him the aman, and Suraqa accepted Islam, and he he migrated to Medina, he lived in Medina. The Prophet ﷺ passed away. Within six, seven years of his death, the mighty nation of the Sassanid Persians collapsed. And as is typical, all of the jewelry, all of the treasures of the palace are gathered and sent to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ is full of treasures and gold. He says, where is Suraqa? Call Suraqa for me. And so Suraqa is called and Umar puts him on his own chair. And Umar finds in that gold the bracelets of Kisra, because everybody knows the promise. He finds the two bracelets of Kisra. He puts them on the hand of Suraqa ibn Malik. And the entire congregation starts saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. This is the fulfillment of what the Prophet said. And in fact, the version ibn Abdul Bar says, they took Suraqa around Medina. Umar ibn Khattab said, Alhamdulillah, who has taken this bracelets away from Kisra, the son of Hurmuz, and given them to Suraqa, a Bedouin from the tribe of the Bani, the tribe of the Banu Mudlij. Alhamdulillah, who has taken them from this mighty man, and given them to this Muslim as what the Prophet ﷺ predicted so many years ago. The story of the Hijrah has a number of small stories and one of the significant ones is the story of Umm Ma'bad. And this was, by the way, outside of Medina by an hour and a half drive in our time. It's still in our time. This place is still called the same as it was called then and it's called Qadid. And that's where this incident took place. Umm Ma'bad narrates the story herself and she says that she is an elderly lady and she is a complete like Bedouin. She is living in the desert in a tent, wandering from place to place, finding food and water. So her husband had left to find some food and she's in her sheepskin or goat tent and she hears the rustling outside of some travelers who ask permission to come in. She asks them to come in and it turns out it's Abu Bakr and the Prophet but she doesn't recognize them because she doesn't know who they are. So the Prophet entered in and Abu Bakr and they said, may we purchase any food from you? And Umm Ma'bad replied that she apologized. She has absolutely nothing to give them. So the Prophet saw in the tent an old goat in the corner. So the Prophet asked permission to milk the goat. Umm Ma'bad but smirked and said, that day has long gone. The goat is beyond giving milk. And so the Prophet once again said, but do you allow me to? And so Umm Ba'ba said, if you want to go ahead, I mean, if that's what you want to do. And the Prophet made dua and he mentioned the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he moved his hand under the udder and the udder filled up with milk right then and there. And Abu Bakr then milked the, the milk from this goat and it brimmed all the way to the top and the Prophet drank, Abu Bakr drank and they left the remainder for Umm Ma'ba and her husband. When her husband returned, he shocked to find the milk. Where'd you get this milk from? From this goat. How did this goat give milk? So she gave the whole story. She described the process in detail. One of them, you know, was taller and handsome and this and that, and the other looked like his companion. Her husband said, those are the two the Quraysh are searching for. Do you not know that one of them claims to be a Nabi? And when she heard this, she realized this
this is not just a claim, he is a Nabi. And so both her and her husband accepted Islam. SubhanAllah, when he's basically running for his life, we have references of at least four or five people converting in this journey from Mecca to Medina. It is also narrated once that a caravan passed them by. They recognized Abu Bakr and they find out some information, whatever they wanted to, and then they asked Abu Bakr, who is this man with you? And so Abu Bakr said, he is my guide, guiding me to the path. And of course, what Abu Bakr meant was, he is my guide to Salat al-Mustaqim, guiding me to the path to Jannah, right? But what they understood was, this is my hired guide that is guiding me. This also shows us, by the way, that at a certain point in time, the guide, Abdullah ibn Urayqit, left them. So the guide basically brought them to a place where from that point onwards, they knew how to get to Medina. So right now, we're basically right outside the city of Medina, and the process is about to come in. Why Medina? Medina, of course, is not its original name. Its original name is Yathrib, surrounded by volcanic rock. And it is blessed with an undercurrent of water. It has always been famous for its dates. And the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Bukhari as well, I have been commanded to emigrate to a city that shall devour all other cities. They call it Yathrib, but it is Medina. And so the Prophet ﷺ changed its name from Yathrib to Medina. And in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says Yathrib, should say Astaghfirullah because it is Taba. And also in another hadith, he called it Al Tayyibah. Taba and Tayyibah mean pure and the source of purity. In a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet said, Oh Allah, cause us to love Medina as much as we love Mecca or even more than this. And our Prophet told us that the Jal will not be able to enter Medina. He will come to Medina trying to destroy it, but he will not be able to enter it because two large angels will meet him at the door and expel him and kick him out. Also, our Prophet said, that no plague shall ever infest Medina. Also, our Prophet ﷺ made dua that Medina be blessed. And he said, hadith is in Bukhari, that, Oh Allah, your servant and Abd and Khalil Ibrahim, he declared Mecca a haram. And I too am your servant and your Abd and your Rasul. So I make dua to you to make Medina a haram. Haram is an area of land that certain things which are halal outside of it become haram inside of it. For example, carrying weapons is haram in the haram. And so Medina is considered the second Thani al haramain the second haram in our religion. Mecca was blessed, some say from when the creation was created, and then Ibrahim announced its blessing. Whereas Medina became blessed with the emigration of the Prophet to it. The Prophet said that no one shall plot to harm Medina except that Allah will dissolve him like salt is dissolved in water. Of the miracles that Allah Azza wa chose Medina for, and this is clearly a divine wisdom, that SubhanAllah, out of all of the tribes of Arabia, out of all of the places in the peninsula, the Prophet ﷺ had a direct blood connection with the people of Medina. In fact, he is a second cousin of some of them. The Prophet ﷺ is a second cousin to the Khazraj because his grandfather's mother is a Khazraji. The number of people living in Medina, how many? The total population of the three Jewish tribes seems to have been around 2,000 men. Multiply that by three for women and children, you get 6,000 Jews, roughly, in Yathrib. The Quran itself references they're waiting for the next prophet, but they expected that prophet to be one of their own. They didn't expect him to be someone else. That Allah says they were expecting a victory over the Aus and the Khazraj. And the Aus and the Khazraj say that whenever we had a war, right, the Yahud would tell us that it's only a matter of time before our Prophet comes and will massacre you. This is the theory that is given. And that is that just like Salman al-Farsi knew that one of the signs of the Prophet is what? That he's going to come in a land of dates, right? So this knowledge was known. We know this for a fact it was known. Why shouldn't these Yehud have it as well? They settle in a land of dates because they know that the Prophet will come in a land of dates. We also know that in the conquest of Mecca, the Ansar had around four to five thousand men participating in the conquest. So four to five thousand multiplied again by average of three, you have twelve to fifteen thousand Arabs. So quantity wise, the Arabs seem to be double the Jews. But the Jews had the power because they had the money and because they had the land and because they had fortresses. And so a rough quantity we get of the people of Medina, roughly around 20,000 people. The Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, now we don't have an exact date, the first week of Rabi' al-Awwal, most likely. And Ibn Ishaq mentions that he arrived on a Monday, and this corresponds to September of the year 622 CE. So 622 is when one Hijrah begins. Medina is not like a major metropolitan city. Medina is not continuously populated. 
Medina had small pockets and every tribe it was in its own small area. The very first settlement of these small settlements of the entire city was that of Quba, outside of what we now call central Medina. And these were separated by either desert or by large date plantations. So the Prophet when he arrived, we know he arrived in Quba and Abdullah ibn Salam narrates that when the Prophet entered Medina, the people rushed to take a look at him. And I was of the first who arrived. When his face became clear to us, I knew that this face was not the face of a liar. And he said, the first thing that I heard him say was spread the greetings of Salam everywhere. Feed the people, be good to your relatives and pray at night when everybody is asleep, you will enter Jannah with peace. And the hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Salam and he is the Jewish rabbi who converted to Islam and he stays at the house of Kulthum ibn Hidim. It is also said that the Prophet stayed in the house of Sa'ad ibn Khaythama, but some reports say that no, he would spend the night at the house of Kulthum and because because Kulthum was a married man with children, he would go to the house of Sa'ad who was a bachelor. And so in this house, guests could come without any problem. And he waited there for Ali ibn Abi Talib to come. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala stayed in the house of another of the Ansar. And the next day, the Prophet began building the first masjid in Medina, which is now called Masjid Quba. And it is said that the first stone was put by the Prophet And it is said that by the time he began building, Ali radiallahu anh had already arrived at what as well. And Ali and Abu Bakr continued and then the Ansar took over from there. Ali ibn Abi Talib says every single week the Prophet would either walk or ride his camel to Quba. Usually on Mondays it is said he would go there and he would pray two rak'at and he said whoever does wudu from his house and prays in Masjid Quba he will get the reward of a full Umrah. Ali is a young boy at the time he's a teenager so he's around 19, 18, 19 now and Ali was told to remain behind in Mecca to return the amounts and the items that had been given entrusted to the Prophet the amanat. There is no bank account, there is no security deposit, there is no safety uh, box. What are you going to do when you have a precious item you're traveling? Or even if you don't want to keep it in your house for personal reasons, you give it to a trustworthy person. And so subhanAllah, despite their animosity to the Prophet despite their hatred of him and his message, still when it came to entrusting what they needed to entrust, his house was the safety deposit. His house was where a lot of these amanat were kept. And so the Prophet had to leave somebody to return these amanat and that was Ali ibn Abi Talib and they also waited for Aisha and Asma, the daughters of Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr had arranged for them to come via another guide. And so Ali and Aisha and Asma, when they came, that was when the Prophet entered the city of Medina. So the Prophet stayed in Quba the rest of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And he announced on Thursday night that he will enter Medina the next morning. And on Friday morning, he وسلم, leaves Quba and Salat al Jumu'ah occurs in the middle. So the first Jumu'ah that the Prophet Prophet prayed was neither in Quba, he actually prays it in the tribe of Banu Salama region. And he gives the first khutbah. And this khutbah has been recorded by Ibn Ishaq and Al-Bayhaqi with a slightly weak chain. The first khutbah that he gave two parts, the first part of it, he encouraged them to be generous and he reminded them of the certainty of death and of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah Azza wa Jal would ask each and every one of them about what he had been given and what he spent with what he had been given. And in in this khutbah, there is a phrase that is a part of an authentic hadith that we all know, and that is that whoever is able to save himself from the fire, even if with half a date, even with a portion of the tamra, let him do so. And if he doesn't even have this, then with kalima tayyibah, with a good word, because every deed is multiplied 10 times. Then he sat down. That's the first khutbah. Second khutbah, he stood up. In the second khutbah, he began with what is called the khutbah tul haja. Verily, all praise is due to Allah, and only Allah is worthy of being praised. Therefore, we praise him and nasta'inuhu. We will ask for his help and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our deeds and the consequences of our souls. Verily, whomever Allah guides, no one can misguide. Whomever Allah misguides, no one can guide him back to the straight path. I testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. This is khutbah tul haja. This khutbah is so powerful that people accepted Islam just because of this khutbah. And the most famous example is that of Limat al-Azdi. And he was from the leaders of the tribes of Yemen. And he was a medicine man. And when he entered Mecca, the people told him, beware of this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He is a sahir or a majnoon or a one of these things. So Limad said, I put cotton in my ears to make sure that I don't hear what he says. Because they warned me so much, I became terrified. So I put cotton in my ears every time he's, I see him so that I don't hear him. Then I said to myself that I am Rajul Aqil, I'm an intelligent man. 
I mean, how powerful can his speech be? If he's wrong, I'll guide him. If he's sick, I'm a medicine man, I'll cure him. So he took the cotton out and he walked up to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Your people have warned me about you, but I want to listen to what you have to say. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shurur anfusina wa zi'ati an man yahdillahu falam wa midhra wa ashadu wa la ilaha rasulun surah. Then he said, Amma ba'd. He was going to begin the speech. The mad said, Qif, repeat these words that you just said. So the Prophet ﷺ repeated the entire speech. He hasn't even begun the lecture. And the mad said, that I have memorized the shi'r of the ins and the jinn. I've memorized the poetry of everyone out there. And I consider myself an intelligent and educated man. But wallahi, I have never heard anything as eloquent as this. By Allah, you must be a man whom Allah inspires. And khalas, he accepted Islam right then and there. Khutbatul Haja caused the mad al azdi to accept Islam. So he started with Khutbatul Haja in the second khutbah. And then he said, the successful one is the one whom Allah has beautified his heart and has caused him to enter Islam after leaving Kufr and has chosen him above the rest of the people for the best of all matters. Love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and love Allah with your entire heart and never tire of the speech of Allah and of the dhikr of Allah. Kalamullah is the Quran. The dhikr is his remembrance and never let your heart become hard. Allah chooses what He wishes and what He blesses. And He has blessed this, meaning the Quran and the dhikr, to be the best deed. So worship Allah and do not associate partners with Him and have taqwa of Him as He said that you should and be sincere to Allah in all that you say. Love one another with the spirit of Allah between you and remember that Allah hates that His promise be broken. Wassalamu alaikum. Where He stopped to pray Jum'ah, that also then became the masjid for that location. Locality. And then after this khutbah, he then entered Medina. And now the news has spread that the Prophet is about to arrive. And so every single day, the Ansar would go outside of the city towards what is now Quba, waiting for the Prophet to come. And so one day they went in the morning waiting and nothing happened. And they came back by 10, 11 o'clock. And in the distance, the Prophet and Abu Bakr appeared, but there were no Ansar there because they were already back home in their houses. And it is said that he entered the city of Medina on a Friday. And it so happened that one of the, the Jewish men was on the top of the tree plucking the dates. So he was the first to see in the distance the Prophet and Abu Bakr coming. So the Jews, the Jew became so happy, he cried out at the top of his lungs that, Oh Arabs, your king has arrived. When the news spread, the Ansar rushed out in hordes, hundreds and hundreds of them. And the Prophet entered, according to one report, on the 2nd of Rabi'ul Awwal, according to another, on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal, in the 14th year of the Da'wah, which was to become the first year of the Hijrah. And Al Bara ibn Azim narrates in Sahih Muslim that I saw the Ansar all dressed up coming out and over 500 men came outside all of them armed meaning to as a welcoming committee and they accompanied the Prophet ﷺ. you know the famous story that we are all told that the little girls were singing right this story for sure it did not happen at the Hijrah the women climbed up onto the houses. The children are thronging around to see. And the Prophet ﷺ is surrounded by literally hundreds, if not thousands of people, all of whom believe in him, all of whom are happy that he is coming. And for the first time, we get a glimmer of hope. Change is in the air. We can sense that a new tide is coming, that the change has begun, that the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will signal a new era. And this is the seed of the first Islamic nation. Here is also the famous story, which is inshallah ta'ala an authentic one, that every one of the Sahaba of Ansar was trying to ask the Prophet to stay with them. And the Prophet said, let the camel go where it is going because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken charge of it. And the camel sat down at a particular place and the Prophet understood this was the place that Allah had decided will be his masjid. When the camel sat down, the Prophet said, whose house of our family members is the closest to us from here? Remember the Prophet ﷺ had distant cousins in Medina. His great-grandmother is Madanese. Here is where Khalid ibn Zayd, also known as Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I am the closest in lineage to you, basically from your camel. My house is the closest to this area. Roughly, he's like a sixth cousin to the Prophet ﷺ, right? Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, we only have a few narrations about him in his house. The Prophet ﷺ lived there, according to Ibn Sa'id, for half a year. And he did this because he didn't have a house to live in, obviously. And he's waiting 
waiting for the masjid and the house to be built. Abu Ayyub's house also had two stories in it. And so Abu Ayyub and his wife moved upstairs and the Prophet and Abu Bakr uh, were living downstairs. Ibn Hisham mentions a story that occurred one night that in the middle of the night Abu Ayyub turned over in his sleep and he knocked over the water bottle. And he became worried that the water would seep from the second floor basically and drip onto the Prophet as he was sleeping. And so he woke his wife up and the two of them, they spent the entire night soaking their own blanket with the water, making sure, and he dreading basically that maybe one drop of water would possibly irritate the Prophet uh, It is also narrated in a hadith in Musa Imam Ahmed that one day Abu Ayyub was with his wife upstairs and then Fantabaha, he realized and he said to his wife, we are walking above the head of the Prophet And he realized this in the evening. And so him and his wife spent the night cramped next to the sides now. So they sit with their feet withdrawn in for the entire night. And the next morning, they go back down to the Prophet ﷺ and they say, Ya Rasulullah, you have to move up. The Prophet ﷺ said, the bottom floor is easier for me. Abu Ayyub said, La Wallahi Ya Rasulullah, we can never ever be on top of you on a roof that your head is over. So they amazingly disobeyed him out of respect, if that's possible. And so the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr then for the bulk of their time actually moved upstairs. It is also narrated that one time Abu Ayyub, he would always cook the food him and his wife and they would send it up to the Prophet ﷺ. Then he would eat the leftovers. Abu Ayyub would ask, where did the Prophet eat from? Which place of the plate? And wherever he ate from, he would eat from that particular portion he would eat from it. One day the food came down untouched. Abu Ayyub panicked. And he rushed upstairs and he said, Ya Rasulullah, what have I done? What is wrong? Is there anything that, you know, the food was not suiting you? What happened? The Prophet said, no, but it has garlic in it. Abu Ayyub said, is garlic haram? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, but I speak to those whom you don't speak to, which means the angels. This is uncooked garlic. If you put it in the food, then it will have a very bad after smell. Getting back to the story of the masjid itself. As we said, the camel sat down in a small area of land. The Prophet ﷺ said, who does this land belong to? They said that it belongs to so and so and so and so. They are orphans, their father owned the land. Now they have inherited this land. So the Prophet ﷺ said, call them here. We're gonna build a masjid here, so we need this land. According to one narration, their names were Sahal and Suhail. When the orphans came and they figured out what the Prophet ﷺ was doing, they were already Muslims. They said, Ya Rasulullah, this is a gift to Allah from us. The Prophet ﷺ said, no. I will only take it with his due price. And he negotiated a price with them and he paid them the money to purchase the land from them. And he ordered that the few date palms that were there, there were probably less than a dozen. He ordered that they all be cut down and he used those very trees to form the walls of the masjid. Talk about being green and conservation. The front and the back walls were made with those trees and the side walls were made with the clay bricks that they had in Medina at the time. And there were one or two graves from very old still over there he ordered that those corpses be buried outside and the Prophet ﷺ participated along with them in the construction of the masjid there was a whole line going the Sira book say from the quarry to the masjid and the Prophet ﷺ became a part of that line and when one of the Sahaba tried to make him sit down and work and do the work the Prophet ﷺ refused and cooperated with them when the Sahaba saw him they said wallahi if we sit down and the Prophet ﷺ is working then this from us is a very astray matter this is a very shameful and misguided thing from us. And it is said that the Prophet ﷺ began saying lines of poetry at the time along with the Ansar and the Muhajirun. Allahumma innahu la khaira illa khaira al akhirah Oh Allah, there is no good other than the good of the Akhirah. Farham al Ansara wal Muhajirah. So have mercy on the Ansar and the Muhajirah. One incident is narrated here and that relates to Ammar ibn Yasir. And he is carrying two large bricks and his entire body has been dusted cover to cover. And he says, and in my opinion, this is like a joking thing to say in that he didn't mean it seriously. He said, Ya Rasulullah, they're killing me by giving me two stones and they're taking only one. So what did the Prophet do? He smiled and he brushed the dust off of him. And he said, no, O son of Sumayyah, they are not killing you. Rather, the people who shall kill you will be Al-Fi'atul Baghiyah. Al-Fi'atul Baghiyah means the group that has gone beyond the bounds. And he also said to him, everybody's getting one reward when they carry their stones you're getting two rewards with your two stones. And he said to him, the last thing you shall drink in this world will be a glass of milk. 
right? SubhanAllah, he predicted the death of Ammar ibn Yasir. It is well known that Ammar was drinking some milk and then he went to fight in the battle and he died. So this hadith was said at the building of the masjid of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam and it is narrated in Al-Bayhaqi's Dala'il that it took almost two weeks to build the masjid. And for its time, it was extremely large. And Allahu A'lam, but some modern estimates have said around 100 by 130 feet. Also, we learned that there were at least three main doors. One on the south side, that's the Bab al-Rahmah. One on the west side, that's called Bab Jibreel. And one on the east side, and that is called Bab al-Nisa. And the reason why it's called Bab al-Nisa is that a few years later, Umar ibn al-Khattab suggested that men and women should not enter with the same door. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, that east door is the door for women. In addition to these three main entrances, there were also a number of small entrances that were private entrances. These were the three public ones. They were at least half a dozen private. Realize in those days, the walls were such a luxury item that people would use the same wall for both sides, right? So if you build a wall here, the other side would automatically be taken by a house. And so whoever is living on the other side of the wall would have direct access to the masjid. So we know for a fact that Abu Bakr was one of those whose house was attached to the masjid. Because on his deathbed, the Prophet ﷺ said, every single door of these private doors shall be locked and sealed from now on, except the door of Abu Bakr. And of course, the main one that we know of for sure is the Prophet ﷺ and Aisha, right? Aisha's house was literally attached to the masjid such that the only thing separating it was a curtain. And this was a private entrance. The house had a public entrance on the other side. We also know from one narration from Hassan al-Basri that the roof of the masjid was actually very low. That if he put his hand up, he could feel the roof of the masjid. We also know that initially the Prophet ﷺ only covered one area of the masjid with a roof. So at one time, the front portion of the masjid was covered covered by thatched palm leaves. Towards the middle of the Madani period, we don't know exactly when, the Prophet ﷺ ordered that a roof be built over the whole masjid. And of course, the blessings of the masjid are well known. It is one of the three sacred masjids in Islam, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. These are the only three sacred lands in our religion, by the way, that one should travel to. We all know as well that a prayer in Masjid al-Nabawi is equal to a thousand prayers anywhere else. We also know that the Prophet ﷺ said, what is between my house and my mimbar is, betu- is one of the rawda. Rawda means a lush garden. Rawda to al jannah. Scholars have differed what does this mean. One interpretation is that that very land will be transferred to jannah. A more common interpretation is worshipping Allah on that land will get you to jannah. We know that in the early portion of the Medinan period, one of the stumps of the tree, the Prophet ﷺ used it for his mimbar. In one hadith in Bukhari, it is said, he even prayed his salah on the stump to show the Ansar how to pray. Until he had to do sajda, then he cannot do sajda. So then he stepped down, he did sajda, and then he went back up onto the stump. So for a few years, he would give the khutbah on this stump. Remember the trees were cut down, one of those trees was used as his mimbar. Then in Sahih Muslim, we learn, that one time the Prophet ﷺ told one of the Ansari ladies there who had a slave who was a carpenter, tell your carpenter to make for me a mimbar. And so the carpenter made a mimbar of three steps. The three steps were placed away from the, the trunk, basically. So the trunk obviously is there and the three steps are over here. During the first khutbah on those three steps, the Sahaba said, we began to hear a wailing, a crying, like that of a baby camel. And we found that the source of this noise was the tree, this stump. And the Prophet ﷺ interrupted his khutbah and came down and hugged the tree, subhanAllah. And it sniffled and stopped crying. Basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us or the Sahaba to hear the emotions of the tree. Anas ibn Malik reports that the Prophet ﷺ said, if I didn't hug it, it would have cried until the day of judgment. And he ordered that the tree that then be uplifted and uprooted and then dug underneath his actual mimbar so that it's still over there. Obviously, the tree is jealous. So the Prophet gave the tree its wish by putting it under the mimbar. And at this, Al Hassan al Basri said, O oh believers, look, this was a tree that was crying because it wished to be with the Prophet ﷺ. Is it not more befitting that those of us who are men should cry even more to be with him? The Prophet ﷺ did not even build his own house until the house of Allah was built. This is just mind-boggling, wallahi, to think about. And because of this, he did not live with his family. He's living with Abu Bakr. We see, therefore, the importance of the masjid. The masjid even before his house, sallallahu The masjid was the place of ilm. This is where halaqat would be given. The masjid was the place of shura. 
Yusra. This is where the Prophet ﷺ called the Sahaba in the Battle of Badr, in the Battle of Uhud. He's calling them. What do you think we should do? It's basically the constitution place as well. It's the place where people come together and decide affairs. The masjid is socialization. The people would socialize over there. The Prophet ﷺ would ask them about their days of jahiliya and they would laugh and joke inside the masjid. The masjid was a place of celebration. Their nikahs would take place in the masjid. From it, even the armies of Islam spread because they would be arranged inside the masjid. And then they would go out from there. And in it, those who had no house would sleep. SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ was in his masjid more than he was in his own house. One thing that we don't know exactly when is the changing of the raka'at of the five salawat. Now, when were the five salawat decreed? We all know. Isra wal Mi'raj. So, people are praying five times a day. However, at that time, every single one of those five was two raka'at. Sometime early on, the Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ started praying as we now know it, right? Two, four, four, three, four. We also know that within the first month or two, the question arose, how was the time for prayer to be given? The Prophet ﷺ called the Sahaba and they said, and he asked them, how should we call the people at the time of the Salah? What is your idea? And so they started discussing what should be done. One of them said, let us use a bell like the Christians. But this was discarded. Others said, let us use a chauffeur, not a chauffeur, a car chauffeur. A chauffeur is what the Yehud use, right? It's a horn. They call it a chauffeur. But also this was discarded. And others gave other ideas, but no idea basically made sense. So the meeting finished without any idea being chosen. That night, two people saw a dream. One of them was Umar ibn al-Khattab. The other was Abdullah ibn Zayd. And their dreams were the same. That Abdullah ibn Zayd saw in his dream a man selling some items, either the horn or the bell or something. So he went up to him and said, can I buy these items? So the man said, why? So he said, because the Prophet wants to tell us how to call the people to prayer. So I'm thinking one of these will do the job. So the man said, should I not tell you something better than that? So the Sahabi said, of course. Abdullah ibn Zayd said, of course. So he said, when you want to give the time for prayer, say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu. And then all the way to the end of the Adhan, right? And then he woke up and the dream was so vivid in his head, he just put on his garments and rushed outside to the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is the dream that I saw. And he told him the entire dream. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this is a true dream. Stand up, O Bilal, because you have the loudest voice. And Abdullah bin Zayd, go up with him to the roof of the masjid and tell him every phrase and he'll repeat after you. And so Abdullah bin Zayd said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And Bilal repeated in a loud voice, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And so technically Abdullah bin Zayd did give the first adhan, but except it was to Bilal. But then Bilal is the one who proclaims it to the entire world. And as he's giving the adhan, Umar comes rushing into the masjid without having fully tied his lower garment, right? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, Allah, I saw these phrases in the dream. So Allah Azzawajal had shown it to multiple of the Sahaba and Allah had willed that Abdullah ibn Zayd was the one who be the one who get the honor of telling it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We already said that the Prophet Sallallahu built the masjid in around two to three weeks. And then after this, he built his houses. He had two wives at this time, Sauda and Aisha. And so Sauda and Aisha's houses were built next to the masjid. These were the only two houses that were connected to the masjid. And he married other women later on by a number of years. And by that time, people had already moved in and connected other houses to the masjid. So the Prophet's other wives' houses were in a separate block. Now, at this stage, hijrah was obligatory on every individual Muslim, down to women and children, to emigrate from Mecca and come to Medina. Except for those who are genuinely weak of the men, women, and children, that they cannot find a way out, nor can they find a passage to get to Medina. For these people, they will be forgiven. The ruling of hijrah from Mecca to Medina, it was fard ayn for the Muslims of that time. And then after the conquest of Mecca, this ruling was abrogated. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, لا هجرة بعد الفتح There is no hijrah after the conquest of Mecca. Is it permissible for Muslims to voluntarily and willingly live in a land that is not a land of Islam? Hanafi and the Hanbali opinion and also the standard Shafi'i opinion is that it is permissible for a Muslim to live in lands that are not Darul Islam with some basic conditions. And of these conditions is that the Muslim is secure in his religion. He's not being tortured. He's not being forced to do haram and he can live an Islamic life. And they base this on an authentic hadith which is as 
explicit as possible. So this is also my position as well. It is a hadith of the Sahabi known as Fudayk. Towards the end of the Prophet's life, after the conquest of Mecca, Fudayk came to Medina. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, the people are saying that whoever does not do hijrah will be destroyed. And in one version he said, my people are upon shirk. My tribe has not yet all accepted Islam, but I'm a Muslim. And so I have been told that I have to make hijrah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Fudayk, establish the salah and avoid the sins and live with your people wherever you like. This hadith is reported in Ibn Hibban's Sahih. How did the early emigrants, how did the Muhajirun find the environment? How did they like Medina? The early Muhajirun did not like Medina because there is truly no place like home. And so the Prophet ﷺ made a special dua for all of the Muhajirun. Oh Allah, make Medina beloved to us like we used to love Mecca or even more than we used to love Mecca. Oh Allah, bless us in our food measurements, meaning all of the food supplies of Medina, right? Oh Allah, take the bad weather and the bad diseases and plagues and throw it outside of Medina in the barren land of Juhfa. And of course Allah answered that dua and therefore the Sahaba began loving Medina even more than they used to love Mecca.